Welcome back to Pagan Valley, everyone. Now that summer is here, I've had time to relax, get some sunshine, and of course, create these videos for all of you. While the editing process takes lots of time, since I'm a production studio of one, I've been enjoying old film classics in the background. I won't bother you with the list of everything I'm watching, but while I was watching them, the old black and white footage jogged a memory that I had about a horrific event in the Hollywood Hills. A Hitchcock script brought to life, except without any satisfying ending. I've decided to reopen the case that revealed that not even the stars we see in the pictures are safe from the evil in the real world. Tonight, we'll be investigating one of the most disturbing true crime mysteries to ever occur. The murder of Elizabeth Short, more commonly known as the Black Dahlia. The Black Dahlia is one of the poster children of American true crime, an investigation that has been going on since 1947. In January of 2022, it will be the 75th anniversary of this heinous crime, and a mystery that almost a generation of true crime investigators have been unable to solve. Before we dive into this, I want to first state that I will not be discussing any of the documentaries covering this case or the Black Dahlia movie from 2006. Although they do have some merit, I want to keep this video centered on the facts of the case, so you all know exactly what the story looks like so far. Elizabeth Short was born on July 29, 1924, in the Hyde Park section of Boston, Massachusetts. She was the third of five daughters of Cleo and Phoebe Short. Around 1927, the Short family moved rapidly to Portland, Maine for a short time, before settling in Medford, Massachusetts the same year. This is where Elizabeth was raised and spent most of her life. Elizabeth's father built miniature golf courses until the 1929 stock market crash, when he lost most of his savings and the family lost everything. In 1930, the family had its first horrible brush with death. Elizabeth's father's car was found abandoned on the Charleston Bridge, and it was assumed that he had committed suicide by jumping into the Charles River. Believing her husband to be deceased, Elizabeth's mother Phoebe moved with her five daughters into a small apartment in Medford and worked as a bookkeeper to support them. Troubled by bronchitis and severe asthma attacks, Elizabeth underwent lung surgery at age 15, after which doctors suggested she relocate to a milder climate during the winter months to prevent further problems. Her mother then sent Elizabeth to spend winters in Miami, Florida with family friends. Until she was 18, Elizabeth lived in Florida during the winter months and spent the rest of the year in Medford with her mother and sisters. But in her sophomore year, Elizabeth would drop out of Medford High School. But then something incredible happened to the entire Short family. In late 1942, the Shore family received a letter of apology from the presumed deceased father, Cleo, who revealed that he was in fact alive and had started a new life in California. In December, at age 18, Elizabeth relocated to Vallejo to live with her father, whom she had not seen since she was six years old. But the rest of her family had already moved on and found themselves unable to forgive him. At the time, Cleo was working at the nearby Mare Island Naval Shipyard on San Francisco Bay, but this new life with her resurrected father would not last long. Arguments between Elizabeth and her father led to her moving out in January 1943. Shortly after, she took a job at the base exchange at Camp Cook near Lompoc, living with several friends. Elizabeth soon left Lompoc in mid-1943 and moved to Santa Barbara. Only a few days after moving, she was arrested on September 23, 1943 for underage drinking at a local bar. 
At the local jail, the infamous mugshot of Elizabeth Short was taken. The juvenile authorities sent her back to Medford, but she returned instead to Florida, making only occasional visits to her family in Massachusetts. While in Florida, Elizabeth met Major Matthew Michael Gordon Jr., a decorated Army Air Force officer at the 2nd Air Commando Group. He was training for deployment to the China-Burma-India Theater of Operations during World War II. Elizabeth told friends that Gordon had written to propose marriage while he was recovering from injuries from a plane crash in India. She accepted his offer, but Gordon died in a second crash on August 10, 1945, less than a week before the surrender of Japan, which ended the war. In her grief, she again relocated to Los Angeles in July of 1946 to visit Army Air Force Lieutenant Joseph Gordon Fickling, whom she had known from Florida. Fickling was stationed at the Naval Reserve Air Base in Long Beach. Elizabeth spent the last six months of her life in Southern California. Shortly before her death, she had been working as a waitress and rented a room behind the Florentine Gardens nightclub on Hollywood Boulevard. Elizabeth had been variously described and depicted as an inspiring or would-be actress. According to some sources, she did in fact aspire to be a film star, though she had no acting jobs or credits. On January 9, 1947, Elizabeth returned to her home in Los Angeles after a brief trip to San Diego. While she was there, Elizabeth was with a man named Robert Red Manley, a 25-year-old married salesman she had been having an affair with. Early in the investigation, Robert claimed that he dropped Elizabeth off at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. Elizabeth told him that she was to meet her sister, who was visiting from Boston. According to the hotel staff, Elizabeth had walked in and began using the lobby telephone. After a few minutes, she hung up the phone and left the hotel alone. Elizabeth was allegedly seen walking the streets by patrons of the Crown Grill Cocktail Lounge, almost a half mile away from the Biltmore Hotel. And just like that, she was gone. No more witnesses saw Elizabeth go anywhere that night, and none of the hotel staff saw her re-enter the Biltmore Hotel. She would stay missing for six long, mysterious days. Whatever happened in that time, investigators would try to figure out. But what they did find is what the aftermath of those six days was. It was the morning of January 15, 1947. Local resident, Betty Bersinger, was on a walk with her three-year-old daughter through the neighborhood. When Betty and her daughter passed a vacant lot on South Norton Avenue in Limmer Park, she believed she saw a store mannequin laying in the middle of the lot. Thinking it was odd that a piece of plastic was just sitting by itself, Betty and her daughter walked towards it. Just after a few steps, Betty was shocked when she realized it had not been a mannequin, but a human body laid in the lot. Taking her daughter by her hand, Betty ran to the nearest house and had the family call the police. The state in which the body was in is what has made the Black Dahlia case one of the most disturbing mysteries in all of American history. Elizabeth's severely mutilated body was completely severed at the waist and drained of blood, leaving her skin an icy white. Medical examiners determined that she had been dead for about 10 hours prior to when Betty discovered her, leaving her time of death either sometime during the evening of January 14th or the early morning hours of January 15th. Elizabeth's face had been slashed from the corners of her mouth to her ears creating an effect known as the Glasgow Smile. She had several cuts on her thighs and breasts, where entire portions of flesh had been sliced away. The lower half of her body was positioned a foot away from the upper, and her intestines had been tucked neatly beneath her legs. Despite the brutality of the body's injuries, 
The torso and legs had been meticulously washed of all blood, dirt, and grime with gasoline. Elizabeth had been posed with her hands over her head, her elbows bent at right angles, and her legs spread apart. Upon her discovery, a crowd of both passerby and reporters began to gather. Los Angeles Herald Express reporter Aggie Underwood was among the first to arrive at the scene and took several photos of the corpse and crime scene. Near the body, detectives located a heel print on the ground amid the tire tracks, and a cement sack containing watery blood was also found in the lot near the body. The autopsy revealed Elizabeth's last few days to the coroner. The methods used to create the infamous injuries on Elizabeth Short's body were extremely skilled and required a lot of medical knowledge to pull off. But the oddest part of the autopsy revealed was that most of the cuts in the areas that cut Elizabeth in half were done after her death due to a lack of internal bruising. The final cause of death was ruled to be hemorrhaging in the head due to some blunt object. Elizabeth was identified after her fingerprints were sent to the FBI and they matched her fingerprints with the ones that were on file from her 1943 arrest. Immediately following Elizabeth's identification, reporters from William Randolph Hearst's Los Angeles Examiner contacted her mother, who was still in Boston. One of the most questionable methods used in the investigation was that William told her that her daughter had won a beauty contest. It was only after prying as much personal information as they could from a relaxed and excited Phoebe that the reporters revealed that her daughter had in fact been murdered. The Examiner and another Hearst newspaper, the Los Angeles Herald Express, later sensationalized the case, with one article from the Examiner describing the black tailored suit Elizabeth was last wearing as a tight skirt and a sheer blouse. It was in these few initial days, the media nicknamed her as the Black Dahlia and described her as an adventuress who prowled Hollywood Boulevard. This was a lie, and a truly unethical one at that. The name Black Dahlia was created since a popular movie at the time was called The Blue Dahlia, and that Elizabeth was well known for wearing all black dresses and pantsuits. Despite the disruption caused by the media frenzy and perhaps some of the most unethical acts of journalism at the time, the investigation into Elizabeth Short's murder case would be long, complicated, and eventually fruitless effort for those detectives involved. It was six days since Elizabeth Short was found cold in Lamert Park. On January 21, 1947, a person claiming to be Elizabeth's killer placed a phone call to the office of James Richardson, the editor of The Examiner, congratulating Richardson on the newspaper's coverage of the case, and stated he planned on eventually turning himself in, but not before allowing police to pursue him further. Additionally, the caller told James to expect some souvenirs of Beth Short in the mail. On January 24th, a suspicious manila envelope was discovered by a U.S. Postal Service worker. The envelope had been addressed to the Los Angeles Examiner and other Los Angeles papers with individual works that had been cut and pasted from newspaper clippings. Additionally, a large message on the face of the envelope read, here is Dahlia's belongings, letter to follow. The envelope contained Elizabeth's birth certificate, some business cards, photographs, some names written on a piece of paper, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen embossed on the cover. The packet had been carefully cleaned with gasoline, similar to Elizabeth's body, which led police to suspect the packet had been sent directly by the killer. Despite the efforts to clean the packet, Several partial fingerprints were lifted from the envelope and sent to the Federal Bureau of Investigation for testing. However, the prints were compromised in transit and thus could not be properly analyzed. On March 14th, an apparent suicide note scrawled in pencil on a bit of paper was found tucked in a shoe 
in a pile of men's clothing by the ocean's edge at the foot of Breeze Avenue, Venice. The note read, To whom it may concern, I have waited for the police to capture me for the Black Dahlia killing, but have not. I'm too much of a coward to turn myself in, so this is the best way out for me. I couldn't help myself for that, or this. Sorry, Mary. The clothes gave no clue about the identity of their owner, who may have been a crucial suspect. Without a moment to waste, the police quickly deemed Mark Hansen, the owner of the address book found in the packet, a suspect. Hansen was a wealthy local nightclub owner and an acquaintance to the homeowners Elizabeth had stayed with. Ann Toth, Elizabeth's friend and roommate, told investigators that Elizabeth had recently rejected sexual advances from Hansen and suggested it as a potential cause for him to kill her. However, Hansen was cleared of suspicion in the case due to his airtight alibi. Hansen had been at his nightclub that night, and all his employees confirmed that he never left, instead choosing to sleep in his office. In addition to Hansen, the Los Angeles Police Department interviewed over 150 men in the ensuing weeks whom they believed to be potential suspects. Robert Red Manley, who had been one of the last people to see Elizabeth alive, was also investigated, but was cleared of suspicion after passing numerous polygraph examinations. Police also interviewed several people whose names were listed in Hansen's address book, including a man named Martin Lewis, who was another friend of Elizabeth's. Lewis was able to provide an alibi for the night of Elizabeth's murder, as he was in Portland, Oregon, visiting his father-in-law, who was dying of kidney failure. A total of 750 investigators from the LAPD and other departments worked on the case during its initial stages, including 400 sheriff's deputies and 250 California State Patrol officers. Various locations were searched for potential evidence, including storm drains throughout Los Angeles, abandoned structures, and various sites along the Los Angeles River. But even after the tremendous manpower gave their best effort, the searches yielded no further evidence. The city council posted a $10,000 reward for information leading to Elizabeth's killer. After the announcement of the reward, lots of people came forward with confessions, most of which police dismissed as false. Several of the false confessors were even charged with obstruction of justice. On January 26, another letter was received by the examiner, this time handwritten, which read, Here it is, turning in Wednesday, January 29th, 10 a.m., had my fun at police, Black Dahlia Avenger. The letter also named a location at which the supposed killer would turn himself in. Police waited at the location on the morning of January 29th, but the alleged killer did not appear. Instead, at 1 o'clock p.m., the examiner office received another cut and pasted letter, which read, Have changed my mind. You would not give me a square deal. Dahlia killing was justified. The graphic nature of the crime and the subsequent letters received by the examiner had resulted in a media frenzy surrounding Elizabeth's murder. Both local and national publications covered the story heavily, many of which reprinted sensational reports suggesting that Elizabeth had been tortured for hours prior to her death. This information, however, was false, yet police allowed the reports to circulate so as to conceal Elizabeth's true cause of death from the public. Further reports about Elizabeth's personal life were publicized, including details about her alleged declining of Hansen's romantic advances. The Herald Express also received several letters from the mysterious killer, again made the cut and pasted clippings, one of which read, I will give up on Dahlia killing if I get 10 years don't try to find me. On February 1st, the Los Angeles Daily News reported that the case had run into a stone wall. With no new leads for investigators to pursue, the examiner continued to run stories on the murder and the investigation, 
which was front page news for over 35 days following the discovery of the body. When interviewed, lead investigator Captain Jack Donahue told the press that he believed Elizabeth's murder had taken place in a remote building or shack on the outskirts of Los Angeles, and her body transported into the city where it was disposed of. Based on the precise cuts and dissection of Elizabeth's corpse, the LAPD looked into the possibility that the murderer may have been a surgeon, doctor, or someone with medical knowledge. By the spring of 1947, Elizabeth's murder had become a cold case with few new leads. Sergeant Finnis Brown, one of the lead detectives on the case, blamed the press for compromising the investigation through reporters' probing of details. In September of 1949, two years later, a grand jury convened to discuss inadequacies in the LAPD's homicide unit based on their failure to solve numerous murders especially those of women and children, in the past several years, Elizabeth's being one of them. In the aftermath of the grand jury, further investigation was done on Elizabeth's past, with detectives tracing her movements between Massachusetts, California, and Florida, and also interviewed people who knew her in Texas and New Orleans. However, the interviews yielded no useful information in the murder, while the killer's movements had were perfectly sporadic and constantly shifting, some would argue Elizabeth's past was extremely similar, which made her killer even more difficult to identify because of how spread out around the country Elizabeth had been. Several crime authors, as well as Cleveland detective Peter Marillo, have suspected a link between Elizabeth's murder and the Cleveland Torso murders, which took place in Cleveland, Ohio between 1934 and 1938. The original LAPD investigators studied the Torso murders in 1947, but later discounted any relationship between the two cases. In 1980, New evidence implicating a former torso murder suspect, Jack Wilson, was investigated in relation to Elizabeth's murder. Detective Sergeant John of the LAPD claimed he was close to arresting Wilson for Elizabeth's murder, but that Wilson died in a fire on February 4, 1982. The possible connection between Elizabeth's murder and the torso murders received renewed media attention when it was profiled on the NBC series Unsolved Mysteries in 1992. Another theory was that on February 10, 1947, the murder of Janae French in Los Angeles was also considered by the media and detectives as possibly being connected to Elizabeth's killing. French's body was discovered in West Los Angeles on Grandview Boulevard, nude and badly beaten. Written on her stomach in lipstick was what appeared to say, fuck you BD, and the letters T-E-X below. The Herald Express covered the story heavily and drew comparisons to Elizabeth's murder less than a month prior, stating the initials BD to stand for Black Dahlia. The last theory I want to mention began when crime author Steve Hodell, son of George Hill Hodell, and William Rasmussen, suggested a link between Elizabeth's murder and the 1946 murder of six-year-old Suzanne Dignan in Chicago, Illinois. Dubbed the Chicago Lipstick Murders, Captain Donahue of LAPD stated publicly that he believed the Black Dahlia and the Chicago Lipstick Murders were likely connected. Among the evidence cited is the fact that Elizabeth's body was found on Norton Avenue, three blocks west of Dignan Boulevard. Dignan being the last name of the girl from Chicago. There was also striking similarities between the handwriting on the Suzanne Dignan ransom note and that of the Black Dahlia Avenger. Both texts used a combination of capitals and small letters, and both notes contained similar misshapen letter P and had one word that matched exactly between the two. Convicted serial killer William Hirons served life in prison for Dignan's murder, 
initially arrested at 17 for breaking into a residence close to that of Dignan. Hirons claimed he was tortured by police, forced to confess, and made a scapegoat for the murder. After being taken from the medical infirmary at Dixon Correctional Center on February 26, 2012 for health problems, Hirons died at the University of Illinois Medical Center on March 5, 2012. Additionally, Steve Hodell, the crime author of this theory, has implicated his father, George Hodell, Elizabeth's killer, citing his father's training as a surgeon as circumstantial evidence. In 2003, it was revealed in notes from the 1949 grand jury report that investigators had wiretapped Hodell's home and obtained record conversation of him with an unidentified visitor, saying, supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia. They couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary because she's dead. At the end of the day, there are dozens of theories that claim to have solved the Black Dahlia case, but most of them are substantiated by one person pointing a finger at someone else, and that alone. The murder of Elizabeth Short is one of the greatest cold cases in the history of the United States. As you can tell, there are so many moving pieces to the story that you could cover a display board in red string trying to connect them all. I personally believe that the confusion and mishandling of this case was because of the time it occurred in. The late 1940s was a difficult time following World War II, and I'm willing to bet that if this murder had happened closer to the 21st century, it would have been solved by now. But almost 75 years have went by now. The men and women who investigated this crime probably share the same beds as Elizabeth Short now. What has been left is a bunch of newspaper articles that sensationalize the true story, police reports and interviews that failed to pin down any suspects, random letters sent by the so-called killer who's probably also dead now, and a bunch of theories with little to no evidence. And that's all there is on the Black Dahlia case. This is one of the few topics I started this channel to talk about, and I hope those of you who watched all of this now have some idea of this infamous cold case mystery, as it is crucial to understanding how far investigations into these mysteries have come since the days of Elizabeth Short. With the Black Dahlia case now discussed, I can now begin to introduce all of you to some far more interesting and lesser known cold cases and unsolved mysteries that I have researched. But who do you think is responsible for Elizabeth Short's murder? Did any of these theories stand out to you? Let me know what you think in the comments. Be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more content. And with that, this has been Pagan Valley, and I wish you all a good evening. Thank you.